if you have a Bible, flip with me to Genesis chapter one. You shouldn't have to flip very far for that. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, the tables in the back should have a Bible. It'll be our gift to you. I want you to keep that, have that. A uh, couple of things before we jump into the text. Uh, Today is really a, a Sunday, it's a little different, it's a Sunday of um, celebration. We're celebrating a few things. Number one, we're, we're celebrating the end of our kind of Embark Part 2 series where we're talking about corporate disciplines that mark a, local, a healthy local church. Number two, it's the end of our Embark ministry year. And, and related to that, the third thing we're gonna celebrate, uh, I'm gonna attempt, we're gonna, we're gonna hope with our, our best hope here to preach a shorter sermon and then I'm gonna walk through that annual report that Scott referenced. So it's kind of like, a test, like don't flip it yet, like don't, don't flip and cheat and look ahead. We're gonna walk through it together here in a little bit. I'm really excited to do that. Uh, where we're going from here is we're gonna, we're gonna spend the next six weeks or so walking through the Proverbs, some of the, some of the different Proverbs, and you're, each of our pastors here at Story Church is gonna preach on a particular topic from the Proverbs, and then we're gonna jump into First Peter in this fall, and I'm really excited for that. So this morning from Genesis chapter one, we're gonna talk about the church that stewards, the church that stewards. When I first got my license, as you do with your younger kids, my, my parents would say like, hey, go run this errand for me. Uh, and my dad would throw me the keys to his truck. Now, he, here's the deal with my dad's truck. My dad owns a business and therefore that, bi- that truck is owned by the business. It's insured by the business. And, and so my dad would throw me the keys to the truck and he would say to me, right, with a stern voice, he would say, be careful, right? Be careful because if, if, a, if a young and Im, immature and ignorant new driver like me were, were not to be careful with the keys of that truck and I were to get in an accident, not only would it have ramifications on me, not only would it have ramifications on my family, it would also have enduring ramifications on the business. If I hit someone, they could come after not just our family but our business as well if I were to crash that truck. And so he, he throws me the keys and he looks at me in the eyes and he says, be careful. And I promise you I was. I only crashed it a couple of times. Took out the garage once on accident. Um, Essentially, what my dad was saying to me is I am the owner of this truck and I am handing over to you temporary responsibility of this thing You need to be careful. You need to be wise. You need to be thoughtful. You need to be a good steward of the thing that I own. In Psalm chapter 24, verse one, we are told, the earth and everything in it belongs to God. He is the creator of everything. He is the owner of everything. He is the governor of everything. Everything you are, everything you have, all of your time, the very breath in your lungs belongs to God and he has handed over to you temporary responsibility to be a good steward over those things. You are not an owner, you are a steward. Listen to C.S. Lewis. Every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. Everything you have Everything you are belongs to God. You are a steward over it. He's thrown you the keys to his truck, so to speak, and looked you in the eyes and said, be careful, be wise, be a good steward. So we're gonna walk through three things today related to stewardship, three questions. We're gonna ask the question, what is a steward? Next, we're gonna say, what is the goal of stewardship? And number three, we're gonna say, how can I become a good steward? Three questions we're gonna try and ask and answer here this morning. So, first question, what is a steward? What is a steward? Look at Genesis chapter one, verse 28. And God blessed them, Adam and Eve. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on earth. There are two key words here that have to do with this idea of stewardship, the, the word subdue and the word dominion. And, and in verse 26, he, he talks about 
dominion and subduing the earth as well there. So th- this text, as much as it is uh, you know, ab- about male and female and, and marriage and procreation, it is about all of those things, but it is primarily a text about us being made in the image of God called to be stewards of his stuff here on earth. He uses the word subdue and dominion. So let's walk through those words. The first word is subdue. To subdue is to take the earth's resources and make them beneficial for humanity. That's what it means to subdue. Take the earth's resources and make them beneficial for humanity. And this is something that's incredible as you kind of like walk down through history and and look at science and technology and see what people have been able to come up with. I mean, I, I was just thinking this yesterday. So today, the, the high is gonna be 98 degrees, right? It's gonna be hot today. What, who's happy about that? John, 98 degrees. Nick Lachey, am I right? 98 degrees. Um, however, the inside of my house is not gonna get any higher than 68 degrees because that's where I keep my AC. Now, why do I do that? You're probably sitting there saying like, your electricity bill has gotta be through the roof, It's not, I've never paid a cent to SoCal Edison. If you work for them, don't tell them that. Um, I have, the lady that owned the home before me, she installed 34 solar panels on top of my roof. 34 of them, I have a 1600 square foot house. Way too many solar panels, okay? Edison is making money off of me every single month. They made $638 off of me in May. That, I track it, okay? Do I see that? I don't. I'm way off track here. (laughs) My house is gonna be 68 degrees because someone learned to harness the sun's power and heat to turn it into electricity for my air conditioner. That's incredible. Think about the the ways we've harnessed energy, wind or solar energy or steam to create things for humanity. What about aqueducts for for crops and for livestock? Who was, we talked about this, Katie and I, the other day. Who was the first person that looked at a cow and said, yum? (laughs) We're going to take care of that thing. And they figured out how to do it. And they, like, how many people had to die to learn what temperature to cook beef to? I don't know. But someone did it. Someone took the earth's resources and learned how to farm and learned how to raise cattle and learned how to harness the sun. They subdued the earth and used it in a beneficial way. And that's a key there. To subdue is to use things for the benefit of all humanity. I mean, we can do a little compare and contrast here, the benefit or the harm. Think about nuclear power. Nuclear power, in in one sense, can be one of the cleanest, most efficient ways we can get a renewable resource um, through nuclear power plants. It's a very beneficial thing. On the other hand, nuclear power can also be used to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where the, the harm of that is still rippling down to today. You can use nuclear power to benefit or to harm people. As Christians, as we look at the earth's resources, we subdue it and say, what has God given me and how can I use this so that those around me might be benefited? Subdue. Then there's the word dominion. That word dominion essentially means you're a vice regent or maybe more helpful, a, a vice president or a vice principal, so to speak. God, God is the owner. God is the king. God is the principal. God is the president. We are vice presidents, vice principles, vice regents. We are under his authority, which means we, you and I as Christians, represent God and his will for the earth. As Christians who know his word, we know God's good design for human flourishing. Okay, We know what it takes to see human flourishing come about because the word is explicit in what that looks like. This is why we raise our kids the way we do. If you have kids, you are raising them not flippantly, but you are raising them within God's good design because you know it will ultimately result in their flourishing, not in their harm. And so as those who have dominion over the earth, we are seeking prayerfully to bring God's will about in every space and every sphere that we find ourselves, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our relationships. We know what human flourishing looks like according to God's good design, so we labor with our effort to see God's good design come about on earth. 
We don't just capitulate to modern teaching. We follow God's good, right, and beautiful teaching and see his will come about. So a steward is one who subdues the earth's resources and has dominion over the places and spaces that God has called us to live and be. So to sum that up, what is a steward? Well, if you were to visit our website on the giving page, you would see this definition. A steward is a person who has been entrusted with and who manages another re- another's resources according to the owner's vision and values. Each of us was created for stewardship by God, and a steward is both a ruler with authority to govern resources and a slave accountable to the owner of those resources. The New Testament calls Christians caretakers of God's truth and gifts, even God's grace. We manage God's resources according to his vision, his value, his values, his principles, his purpose and plan for this world. But a key here in in how we steward those things is in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, God in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. To be made in the image of God, or as verse 26 says, in the likeness of God, means that we share qualities with God, and when redeemed, By the blood of Jesus, we are called to reflect God to this world. We are image bearers, redeemed by the work of Jesus, who now look like God in our behavior and with our words and our actions and how we steward the things God has entrusted to us. So as image bearers, we reflect the character of God in our stewardship, which means we aren't people who exploit or pillage or consume or destroy the creation God has called us to steward, but instead we steward things in a way that looks like God, God's character. I want to highlight a little bit of what it looks like to steward things in God, looking like God's character. First, we steward wisely. We steward wisely. God is wise. And being made in his image means we are capable of wisdom. So we make decisions about the things that have been entrusted to us. And when we make those decisions, we are careful and thoughtful and deliberate in our decision making. We are not flippant or absent-minded. You, you look at all the things God has entrusted to your care and you say, am I carefully using these things for the glory of God and the good of others? We steward wisely. We steward generously. Giving is in the very nature of God's heart towards us. The the most famous scripture passage of all time is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Through Jesus, we can possess eternal life and we will not perish and we will be with Jesus forever. But, But the key is the first part of that. God gave his only son to accomplish our redemption and salvation. Our God is a giving God. And so when we call you to give generously at Story Church, all we're saying is we want you to look more like God. We want you to reflect the character of God. He is a giving God. Let us be a giving people. We steward the things of this earth faithfully. To be faithful means you are a loyal person. You are dedicated to the things of God. You have a long-term commitment to what God is doing in this world. To faithfully steward the resources God has entrusted to you means you constantly are asking the question, is God honored by the way I'm using my time? Is God honored by the way I'm using my belongings? Is God honored by the way I'm using my gifts? Is God honored by the way I'm using my money? Is God honored by the way I'm using my relationships? We are to be faithful because God is faithful. We steward the things of this earth lovingly. God is a loving God. God is love, 1 John 4 tells us. We steward the things of this earth with the end game that God would be more and more and more beautiful to others and more and more and more loved by others. And we steward things so that others around us would be more and more and more loved by God. The end game of stewardship is that God would be loved and that he would love us. We steward the things of this earth patiently. 
We steward the things of this earth patiently, which means we're not constantly thinking through measurables and bottom lines and return on investment. That is a crippling way to live in the economy of God. Why? Because God is patient. God is slow. God works in his own time, in his own timetable. God works at his own pace. And as fallen and feeble, impatient people, it is never quick enough for us. And so what do we do? We stop stewarding things for God's glory because we get impatient and we say, God, I can do better than you. I'm gonna take it from here. Instead of stepping back and saying, I, I don't know what kind, of, what kind of seed I'm sowing here, but, but seeds take forever to sprout and I'm just gonna wait on you, Lord, to bring the return. And then finally, we steward the things of this earth fruitfully. We wait to see gospel fruit come about which is the only enduring fruit. The only enduring fruit in this world is fruit that is born of the love of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are called to be stewards who subdue the things God has given us. We have dominion over the spaces and places God has given us. And, and, and as we look and we take an account of everything under our care and under our stewardship, we say, God, I want to look more like you as an image bearer, and I want to steward these things wisely and generously and faithfully, lovingly, patiently, and fruitfully. This is what a biblical steward is, which leads to my second question. What is the goal of stewardship? What is the goal of stewardship? Thankfully, Genesis 1 gives us the answer. God gives the goal. When he blesses Adam and Eve, and what does he say to them? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, this certainly has a lot to do with marriage and raising children and, and, and all of those things. But this is so much more than that. God has a plan for everyone and God has a plan for every place. God, his entire goal was sending his son and his redemptive plan is that people everywhere, everywhere would worship him and him alone. He says in, in Habakkuk, through the prophet Habakkuk, that his glory will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Jesus, in the Great Commission, sends his followers to every corner of the globe to preach the good news so that people everywhere would hear about King Jesus and turn and follow him. When God is telling us to be fruitful and multiply, he is saying you need to do the work of sharing the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's why we steward our time. That's that's why we steward our money. That's why we steward our gifts. That's why we steward everything God has entrusted to us so that people towards the ends of the earth would know and follow Jesus. The goal of stewardship is to spur on evangelism and discipleship. That's the whole goal. Let me sum it up this way. The goal of stewardship is for God to be glorified, for his kingdom to grow, and his people to to be blessed. Goal of stewardship is for God to be glorified, his kingdom to grow, and people to be blessed. So the question then becomes, what are you stewarding? What are you stewarding? How can you take an account for what you have in your life? You can think of it in kind of three categories. You have your time, your talents, and your treasure. Time, talents, and treasure, the three Ts. Time, talent, treasure. I'm gonna say it till it's in your brains. Time, talent, treasure, time, talent, treasure. We have these things that God has entrusted to us and he wants us to use those things so that his name would be glorified, his kingdom would expand, and people everywhere would be blessed. Think about how are you stewarding your time? We ask ourselves the question, we ask one another the question, how did you spend your time this week, right? And that word spend is important because time is an ever-decreasing currency that you can never get more of. The Bible tells us our days are numbered before we even walk this earth. You, you can't, no matter how far science and technology goes, you cannot extend your life one second beyond how long God has numbered for you. Time is the only decreasing currency you can never get more of. And so you have to ask yourself the question, how are you spending your time? How am I spending my time? Um, my friend this week uh, sent me a little meme that went around on the internet. I forgot to put it on the screen, so I'm just gonna pull it up here and read it to you. It says this, adulthood is saying, but after this week, 
things will slow down a bit over and over until you die. Adult, adulthood is saying after this week, things will slow down a bit over and over until you die. Amen. Amen. But does that narrative have to be true? Does that narrative have to be true? Or are you and I, are we just cogs in this machine, this modern machine spurred on by by technology and and measurables and trying to keep up with the Joneses and all these kind of things where we've just willingly put ourselves on the conveyor belt of being nothing more than robots and pragmatists that say my time is meant to be maximized for everything. And, And listen, Katie and I, we are so guilty of this. We try to turn every hour into two hours and every dime into a quarter. We try to multiply everything and stretch everything. And at the end of the day, we sit down on the couch after we put the kids to bed and we look at each other and say, how are you? Tired. Why? It's our own fault. Because we haven't created any margin or or space or time in our calendars, and therefore we are not stewarding those things for the glory of God, the advancement of the kingdom, and the good of other people. We are, but not in ways that we fully can, because we are just on this hamster wheel of production. And we need to slow down and step off of that and say, God, my time is yours. How can I use it as you see fit? How can I be present with people? How can I be available? How can I love others? You have time. You have talents. Ken preached on this a few weeks ago. Your talents, your gifts from God. You are uniquely wired and uniquely placed by God with a particular set of gifts meant to be used in the service of others. Are you in the game or are you sitting on the sidelines? How are you using your gifts to serve others? And then finally, you have your treasure you have your treasure, right? This is the one we're all afraid to talk about. Like, oh man, here we go again. We're gonna talk about money. Yeah, we're gonna talk about money because God talks about money. Are you using your treasure for the glory of God, the advancement of his kingdom, and the good of other people? Are you? We'll celebrate it in our annual report here in a second, but yeah, many of you are, and praise God for that. But if you're not, how can you? We talk about it this way. If you're not giving, start giving. If you're giving sporadically, give in a regular planned way. And and if you're giving regularly, take the 1% challenge. Kick it up a percent and see what God does. Just kick it up 1% and see what God does. And every time we talk about giving at Story Church, it's not because we want something, uh, you know, from you. It's because we want something for you. What we want for you is for you to grow in your stewardship, to look more like Jesus and thereby get closer to him and then watch your treasure be multiplied to see people saved and discipled into the image of Jesus. You have your time, your treasures, and your talents. How are you using those things for God's glory? The final question I wanna ask here is this. How can we become good stewards? Uh, again, we'll celebrate this here in a second, but God has done a mighty work through you, Story Church, in the last year. Praise God for that. Um, but there is always room for us to continue to grow. So I wanna think about four principles here for how we can grow in our stewardship. The first principle is ownership. Ownership, okay? I, I gotta talk about this consistently when we talk about stewardship because I'm not so sure we get it. I think we're all glory hungry, I think we're all grabbing after the throne. We wanna sit on the throne and claim to be the owners ourselves instead of letting God be the owner. He owns everything. Um, You are an administrative assistant, okay? That's your job title. You might have a job title here on earth, you know, like teacher, nurse, uh, stay-at-home mom, whatever your job title is here on earth, but your overarching job title, administrative assistant. Eat that humble pie, okay? You are not the owner. You are not the boss. Therefore, our stewardship is simply us expressing obedience to the owner regarding what he wants done with it. Stewardship is a commitment to see God's possessions as his to be used for his purposes, not yours. We do not have the right to control our property, ourselves, our lives, our time, our talent, our treasures. God is the owner. 
Get that into our heads. Get that into our hearts, guys. Second, responsibility. The second principle is responsibility. Listen to Bill Peel. Although God gives us all things richly to enjoy, nothing is ours. Nothing really belongs to us. God owns everything. We're responsible for how we treat it. That's what you're responsible for and what we do with it. While we complain about our rights here on earth, the Bible constantly asks, what about your responsibilities? Owners have rights, stewards have responsibilities. What is your responsibility? Manage what God has given you for his glory and for the good of others. I'm just gonna keep saying that phrase on repeat. That's your responsibility. So how are you looking at the things that that God has entrusted to you? Your home, are you using that for, for God's glory? Your money, are you using that for God's glory? Your car, are you using that for God's glory? Your relationships, your children, your friendships, your food, everything, none of it's yours. You didn't earn it. God graciously gave it to you. Let us be good, responsible managers of using these things in the way God has called us to, which leads to the third point, accountability. God is the owner. We are responsible for, to care for it in the way he demands, and we will be held to account. This is the maxim, the main point taught in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. God entrusted an authority over creation to us, and, and we're not allowed to rule over it as we see fit. We are called to exercise our dominion under the watchful eye of our creator God and manage his resources in accord with his principles and his desires. And in the parable of the talents, we, we had one that, that was given one talent, one that was given two, and one that was given five talents, and the, the, the two that had, had five talents and two talents, what did they do with them? They multiplied them. They were fruitful. They had subdued their talents. They had dominion over those talents. And they multiplied them. The one with one talent, he buried it and sat on it. Did nothing with it. Hoarded it. Didn't share it with others. Didn't bless others. And, and what happens at the end of Matthew 25? Jesus looks at the, the two that had two and five talents, and he says to them these words that you and I should long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And he says to the one with one talent that simply buried it, you failed. We will be held to account for how we use the resources. And I'm not saying that, to, again, to like stoke fear in any of us. I'm saying that to put a healthy sobriety in our souls, that everything we have belongs to God. Are we using it the way he asks us to? We will be held to account for it. And then our final principle here is reward. <clears throat> Excuse me, reward. Now, I'm a little afraid to talk about this one because a lot, of, a lot of modern false teachers have taken that word reward and they've perverted it, right? It goes like this, give to our church and God's gonna give you tenfold, right? Listen, you guys wanna test that? We'll take your offering, okay? <laughs> but we don't teach that around Story Church. That's nonsense. When we talk about reward, we are talking about what God promises us in the gospel. In Colossians 3, 23 and 24, Paul says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Essentially what he's teaching there is if you're a good steward of the things that belong to God, your reward is Jesus Christ himself. That's what you get. That's what you get in the gospel in the first place. You get Jesus. When you go to glory, you're gonna get more of Jesus, an everlasting fount that won't run dry of Jesus Christ. Here on earth, as we grow in our stewardship, as we continue to grow being faithful with what God has given to us, we get more and more and more of Jesus. Again, in the parable of the talents, the two that were found faithful, Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant, but he keeps going. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. At the end result of good stewardship is happiness. I mean, come on, guys. That's promised to us in the gospel. You ever been to the so-called happiest place on earth and seen a single person smiling? 
every dad there is miserable because they just spent $2,500 to get six people in and they're like, gosh, I could have you know, like paid the mortgage with that. And every mom there is like, I wish my husband would help me. I'm chasing these kids around. It's hot. We're waiting in lines. We, this food stinks. Like, I don't know what's going on here. And then you go on a ride and you're like, ha, ha. And then you get off the ride and you're like back in a line. You're miserable again. <laughs> So-called happiest place on earth. No. The happiest place on earth is with your master, King Jesus. And when you are a faithful steward, your happiness in the Lord is a reward, right? I can promise you that. This isn't prosperity preaching. I can outpromise prosperity preachers. There are more beautiful promises than simply temporary wealth here on earth. That won't satisfy your soul, which is why every wealthy person on earth is miserable. I mean, you guys watched the debate. That was misery. That was misery on display, and it was sad. All the wealth on earth can't make you happy. But happiness in King Jesus, as we grow to look more like him and we steward these things for his glory and for the good of others, this is why the Bible teaches us it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because at the other end of that blessing is more happiness. God knows what he's doing when he commands us to give. He is saying there is a reward and it's being satisfied in Jesus. So to be a good steward, you have to see God as the owner, see yourself as responsible for the things he's entrusted to you. You will give an account for those things, and if you're a good steward, he will reward you with more joy and more happiness in him. So church, let us be a people who are fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and have dominion over all that God the owner has entrusted to our care. Individually, again, the three T's. I'm not gonna make you recite it back to me. Time, talent, treasures. Maybe next week. Time, talent, treasures. Think about those things. Take an account this week. Spend some time if you're married with your spouse. If you have roommates, sit down with your roommates and just be honest. Look at, look at your calendars. Look at your bank statements. Look at the way God has gifted you and consider, am I using this? Am I using this in a way that God is glorified and that people are blessed? Church, corporately, uh, we, we have taken a very long view of how we want to steward God's resources here at Story Church. What we are attempting to do is lay brick by brick by brick a foundation that will last for generations. I, I've talked about this almost ad nauseum for the last year. We want to continue to pray as a body that God will give us a permanent home at Story Church. And we pray it's this one. And it's not because we want the comforts of our own building. It's because we want to see this building as something that is stewarded for God's glory and the good of our city. We, we use this building right now on Sundays for, from about 7.30 to 10.30. We want to use this building and that building and the rest of this land every day of the week. We have vision for what God could do with this place if we're able to lay down our roots here. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it looks like us as your pastors equipping you, the saints, for the work of the ministry. So, so, so that's our job description. That's what we're supposed to do. What we are called to do is when we gather, your pastors here at Story Church are called to equip you. Your staff is called to equip you, to make you able and ready and aware so that when you scatter out of this place Monday through Saturday, you can go make disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to use this building in that way, in bigger ways, and we want to leave a legacy behind us that when none of us are worshiping here, I've said this before, but when some you know, crazy kid down there right now that's probably getting in trouble and sitting in time out in the elementary room is one day going to be standing here preaching the gospel, and he's going to be pastoring this church, and our future home group leaders are down there, and our future evangelists are down there, and our future worship leaders are down there. And here's what's, what's even more stunning, guys. Future pastors of this church aren't even down there right now. They're at home. They don't know Jesus. Their parents don't know Jesus. But they're going to hear Jesus. 
because you are the person God has called to be sent to them to share the gospel with them. Like, doesn't that fire you up? And the promise of the, of, the, of the gospel is that God, before the foundation of the world, chose those who would be his. So we go out not fearful, oh my gosh, are people going to follow Jesus? We go out in confidence that nothing can thwart the plan of God. So I'm going to go into that neighborhood, I'm going to share the gospel, some kid's going to get saved, and, and it's going to be this, you know, two steps forward, one step back journey of discipleship till one day that person who's far off from Jesus right now is going to be up here preaching. I mean, come on, can't you see that vision? How cool is that? But in order to get there, guys, we have to steward further than just today. We have to see longer than just today. We have to see our things and our money and our time as something God uses over time for his glory and for the good of others. Let us be a church that stewards well. So with that, what I want to celebrate here now is all the ways that we as a church have grown in that. So now you can go ahead and grab these annual reports. And I just wanna walk through them and and celebrate them. Celebrate all that God has done here. So if you just open it up and, uh, by the way, Scott uh, Workman designed these things. He did a great job on this and and he's celebrating by being somewhere in Italy right now eating pizza, good for him. Uh, Okay, let's walk through this just kind of uh, frame by frame. The first one is attendance. You you can see there our weekly attendance has gone up about 43% from this time last year. Now, this this time last year, a year before, two years ago this time, uh, we we grew by 60% in one year and 43% last year. It's 103% over the last two years that we have grown as a church body. And, and listen, one of my favorite things is last year we got, to, we got to baptize, like, I forget the number, but it was a lot of people. We're growing now by conversion growth. All those things I just talked about, those people in their neighborhoods that don't know Jesus, they're coming to know Jesus and getting baptized at Story Church. Now, now here's the thing. Every one of those people represents a soul and a story that needs to be pastored and shepherded and cared for. And, and guys, this, I hope this is always the case, by the way. Our resources are always behind the amount of need. Do you hear what I'm saying? Our resources are always behind the amount of need, the amount of people to care for and, and, and develop and equip and disciple and get connected to groups. It is always outpacing our time and our resources and praise God for that. I don't want the growth to slow down. I want it to speed up because I believe what God's doing here is something special and unique and I want everyone to get in on it. You can see our Christmas Eve and our, our Easter numbers um, just so you can, you can kind of like understand what we do with those. Um, those, th- those, that number there, especially on Easter, Easter, we don't get a lot of visitors at Story Church on Easter. We get a lot on Christmas Eve, not on Easter. Easter is generally speaking, everyone who calls Story Church home finally comes on the same week. <laughs> right? And then we get it, vacations and work and things come up, but, but it's just, it, it, it's part of it. That's crazy to me, guys. That's crazy to me. And our Easter number is generally reflective of what our number, our, 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 our number is gonna trend towards in about six to nine months. So we are a few months out from, from this being about what's gonna happen on a monthly basis. Like you, 382 unique people are gonna walk through these doors and hear the gospel. Um, that's awesome. And you guys are really bored with it and you shouldn't be because God's at work. <laughs> Um, family ministry. I love, I love what's going on in family ministry under um, Andrew's leadership. Uh, Story Kids, I think he told me this week these numbers are really dated, so sorry about that. Um, we're getting somewhere upwards of 50 or 60 kids down in that building at one time every Sunday alongside another 10 to 15 volunteers, and I think the number is creeping towards 90 kids who are on our roster on a rotating basis each and every week. I love what's happening in student ministry and um, students who are in the room. I hope you love what's happening in student ministry, and those of you who are in fifth grade about to go uh, into sixth grade, which is like this whole host of boys, we call them a gaggle, these gaggle of boys that are causing issues down there, but they're going to get into, they're going to get into youth ministry and probably cause issues issues up here because that's what fifth and sixth grade boys do, and I love it. Why? We call this the most unreached people group at Story Church. 
and, and we're seeing conversion happen, we're seeing baptisms happen, we're seeing life happen in our family ministry. Uh, you can see what's going on with connect cards down there. Uh, let me point out serving here for a second. Uh, this is the only one that went down from last year. Last year we had over 100 people serving on a, on a monthly basis. This year it went down to 93. And here's my hypothesis on this. I'm not a scientist, but it's my hypothesis. When the church grows and we stand up here and we say, hey, there's a need, everyone looks around and says, there's a lot of people in the room, someone else will do it. You might be the answer to that need. And if you've been at Story Church, again, we say this a lot, if you've been at Story Church for any length of time and you're not yet serving, um, I want you to get in the game. There is so much in it for you if you can serve. So, so my prayer and my hope is by this time next year when we walk through one of these you know, thingies, we can get back up over 100. Groups, we have 105 people in groups, 36 new group members in the last year. We're getting ready to launch maybe three, probably two home groups this fall. So if you're looking to get connected to a group, the best way for you to do that is go to our website, click on the groups tab, and we will get you connected. They're taking the summer off, but here in August, September, they're gonna pick up again with some steam. I'll go ahead and flip it over to the other side. This is a fun one. Um, we can track what happened with our attendance and our budget in the last couple of years. You can see in 21, 22, we had a healthy year. We were, we were growing our budget. Our giving exceeded our budget. So naturally, we upped our budget going into 23, and our giving went down. What's unique about our giving going down in 23 is that our attendance actually went up. Again, the same hypothesis. Everyone else is gonna do it. No, I don't have to do it. Everyone else will. But then, guys, look at this year. You guys have been good stewards. Thank you. As I've got up here week after week, month after month, and our pastors have talked about giving and being faithful in your giving, you guys heard and were obedient to the demands of Jesus in the scripture. Largely, you were obedient. And, and we, like your, your pastors and elders, like we pray and thank God for you often because this is amazing. Now, now hear me. When we talk about the budget, and, and like my eyes kind of glaze over when we talk about the budget and Nathan's serving down in kids right now so he's not gonna freak out about this but like my eyes just kind of glaze over. I'm like, oh, here we go again, the budget. When you give, you are certainly giving to the budget but that budget doesn't serve the budget. Okay, we're not a business. The budget serves people and souls and stories. And I can't wait. In August, we got a whole host of videos that are being produced to share with you stories of God's grace at Story Church. And we, and we, get, we have a couple more baptisms coming up here in the next month or so. Stories of God's transformative grace. When you're giving to the budget, you're not giving to a budget. All you're giving to is God's grace being multiplied to the ends of the earth. And you can see it there with the missional giving. This last year, we gave away 71000 dollars to the ends of the earth. And my prayer has been, Lord, in this next year, let's exceed 100,000. Let's exceed 100,000 in one year that we've been able to give outward because our people have continued to be good stewards of God's grace. That's a big number. That's a lofty number. I'm terrified saying that out loud, but listen, we can do it. And so again, we just want to say thank you for being a good steward. The call in this next year is for us to grow in our stewardship to take an account for what God has given us and to find ourselves more and more faithful. So with that said, um, I just wanna pray for us. I wanna pray a prayer of thanksgiving for you and a prayer of thanksgiving to God because he is at work at Story Church. And I'm truly humbled that I get to be a part of this and my prayer is that you're humbled that you get to be a part of this. Like, like God's doing something here. And we all get to play a role in this through our stewardship. So let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you gave Jesus so we didn't have to be lost and dead in our sins and trespasses. Thank you that you have given to us so much good. You are the giver of good gifts. And we, as your people, have so many good gifts. God, I pray you would help us with your wise eyes to see everything we have as something you own and we are called to be stewards of. God, help us 
to grow in our stewardship, to be careful and deliberate and thoughtful with how we're using our time and our talents and our treasure. And God, as we give and as we grow in our stewardship, God, I pray you would indeed increase our happiness and our satisfaction in you. And I pray that as we give and we grow in our stewardship that the gospel would continue to um, go outside of these walls into every space and place of Rancho and the surrounding communities so that more and more people can come to know Jesus, loved by Jesus, saved by Jesus. That's the whole point of this, God. God, I thank you for these men and women, those who have faithfully and sacrificially given of their time and their money and their service to see your glory and your kingdom grow at Story Church. God, would you honor that? And would you, Lord, allow them to hear from you the words, well done, good and faithful servant, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Every one of us have already heard that phrase, and so God, help us to grow in looking more like him, the one who saved us and made us righteous. As your image bearers, God, we just wanna reflect you to this world. So help us to do that, God, through our stewardship. And when we stand up here this time next year celebrating this annual report, God, would you blow our minds with what you've done? Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.